Hello, hello. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Hi, kids. Coming in. Hi, kids. Hey. Hi. 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 Hi, Shirley. Hello. Hi. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Hi, Shirley. Wow. Hi, Paula. Where's my sister? Hi. Hey. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, there's her friend. Where's my sister? Hi, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Hi Shirley. Barb. Hi. 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 It's kind of a reunion sort of deal here. Yeah, so yeah. as everyone's coming in, if you want to say hi, and then um, hi. if you want to write hi. in the chat where you're coming from, um, I'm going to ask that once you say hi, that you turn off your mic so that we can have a good sound quality for the show. Um, but, yeah, we'll get started in a couple minutes. <laughs> hi, Joe. Hey. Over there. We get close so they can see us. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, everybody. Hey. Hi. Hello, welcome. Hey. Hi, Hi. Hey. Hey. Coming up is Tessa. Talking. All right. So we have Joanna Gary. and Mark hey. coming from yes, NYC. So again, as you're coming in, I'm going to ask you to turn off your mics once you say hi, <laughs> um, so that we can hear okay. the, the show with the best quality. Is this it over here on the left? And if you're Thanks. just coming in, if you want to comment in the chat <coughs> where you're coming from. Uh, We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Welcome, everyone. Something's wrong. Hi. Everyone else is muted. <laughs> They're all talking. So I'm going to start muting mics, enough. not to be muted. mean, but just so that we can muted. not have okay. interference. Well, see this? So please see don't this? get offended if I say Yes, start. and look at, look at all the ones that aren't. Where? All right. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Got a lot of happy faces here. <laughs> welcome. Oh, let's see. So Geraldine from NYC. It's been that way all along. Ola coming yeah. from Burlingame. Yes, it has. But what about Sean from Monterey? I don't know what's Who's going on. Supposed to be unmuted. Yeah. So as people are coming in, if you can please mute yourselves. I'll um, type no sound. Hi, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Her name is Patricia. Is never, okay. Coming from the other side of Overlook Circle here in Point Reyes. I mean, awesome. I don't think we're supposed to be, uh, have the sound on. Green Bray, Branch of the Turners. Someone saying hi, Aunt Shirley. Uh, Leah. Okay. Harry and Dolores from Fresno. And someone saying no sound. Okay. Um, <coughs> Marcia and Dawn from Berkeley, welcome, welcome, everyone. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a pretty good group here. We've got a great group. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Mr. Uh, my name is Laurel Ann Riley, and I'm super excited to be here with you this evening in honoring and hearing from Shirley. Um, just a second. I'll let a couple more people in. Shirley. Now, Shirley's yeah, Shirley. unmuted. So, um, <laughs> I, I'm super, like I said, I'm super excited to be um, welcoming Shirley Salzman, an incredible local artist uh, who's lived just an amazing life um, full of travels and all sorts of experiences um, and all sorts of different mediums of art. So um, thank you everyone for being here. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, if you can please keep your mic um, muted so that we can hear uh, Shirley talking. And if you have any questions at any point of the night, um, feel free to write it in the chat. If you don't know where the chat is, it should be, if you're on a computer, it'll be at the bottom in the middle of your screen. And if you're on a phone, it kind of varies, but it's usually somewhere near the bottom too. Um, so you can write whatever question, I'll be monitoring the chat and I'll, you know, whenever there's a convenient moment, I'll ask Shirley your question. <laughs> So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our curator, uh, Richard Clark. There we go. Hi. Um, I mean, you can spotlight me. Yes, um, you are spotlighted. I am spotlighted. Oh, yeah. it's not showing up here. You're sh oh, that's because we have you're on my screen, but they're seeing me. OK, it's different than I expected. Welcome. I am thrilled that we are 
going to have some time with Shirley Saltzman. I got to spend lots of time with her, learning about her art, learning about her uh, travels around the world doing art. And, um, and I've known her for a long time, live in the same neighborhood, but I really had no idea of the breadth and um, creativity that, um, that Shirley has. Um, I'm on the art committee at the Dance Palace. Our Dance Palace is our local community center. We have uh, classes for all ages. We've got um, senior lunches. We've got Tai Chi. We've got um, yoga. We've got um, the, uh, what is that called? The G kinder gym for toddlers. We've got um, incredible concerts throughout the year. Uh, plays, uh, weddings are held here. It's an amazing community center and we really have um, uh, got a lot of pride in, in what we're able to do for the community. And this piece, this gallery, this reception is one of the things that we're doing as a result of um, having been shut down for this whole year. We haven't had any of those classes here or there at the dance palace because of the COVID. So um, we were concerned about that. You know, we lost all that revenue from those classes. We um, wanted to keep our art presence in the community alive. And the art committee came up with the idea of doing a virtual art show and a virtual art reception. And so you all are part of the fifth gallery reception that we've done. Traditionally, we've had artists from the local community, uh, folks that have been producing art for some time, folks that are known well outside the community across the country, uh, and emerging artists, young artists, new artists, people that haven't had shows but have got um, the courage to bring their art to our gallery um, because we didn't have a gallery any longer you are a part of the gallery oh thanks i just showed up um so um i guess what i want to do is just just tell you what a joy it was to work with shirley <clears throat> and to find out more about her um and actually <laughs> this morning i'm walking my dog i walk by the house that is next door to shirley's and the owner of the house has just dug a hole to put a, um, a potted plant in the ground. And in digging the hole, her shovel hit something hard and she pulled out two different concrete hearts that were in the ground, unknown to her, unknown to the guy that she's living with. And it turned out that those were hearts that Shirley made 25 years ago uh, as a, um, a way of taking advantage of some leftover concrete and she made paths with hearts. And what I'd like to say is that, that I think everything that she does do is with heart. She just has a, a wonderful passion about being creative and uh, not holding back. There are no judgments in the way of, of her expression. The... Um, the other thing I'd like to say that was really important when we finished talking about uh, her art life was that it's not important to her that these paintings or collages or sculptures are the highlight of the show. What's a highlight for her is that people who come to the show have an opportunity to find something that they might like to try themselves try a collage, pull out those old National Geographic, rip them up, make, make art in the curious, uh, expressive way that Shirley does um, and just have fun with it. And I just, I really found that um, quite a gift that that, that was what was of uh, her interest. So what do we got here? We've got a kid in 1952 that gets a commission to do uh, a piece of art in her second grade class. 
Uh, we've got somebody's mic on somewhere. If you look down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you're going to see a little microphone that says mute underneath it. And you can click on that, and it'll shut off your microphone. Thanks. Sorry for the diversion. Um, so we're going to, we started with that. She showed me this piece. We'll see it today. From uh, growing up on the peninsula in San Mateo, she moved to Berkeley to go to UC Berkeley um, in fine arts, graduated, did one of those things. I don't know if they do them anymore, but in 1967 when I graduated, and that's when she graduated, she was uh, involved in an interview with somebody that helped you figure out what you might be able to do with your degree as you took off from the university into life. And she had this interview and it culminated in the fact that the, um, the uh, person that had <laughs> interviewed her said, well, Shirley, you're unemployable. <laughs> and Shirley was really excited about that. It was one of those things that she hadn't imagined could happen, this thing. The person said, you can't type and you can't do dictation and you're unemployable. So that sent her down to Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley to start sewing with her sewing skills, clothing for a local hippie shop. And, um, and that was the beginning of taking her art muse um, online, so to speak, or on the avenue. Um, from that point, there were other things that she did to support herself. Um, she began illustrating books. She did a lot of posters for the anti-war effort. Um, and then she um, had a friend with a gallery in San Francisco that she did landscape, pa landscape paintings for. So she was beginning to survive and it was just barely survival from what I understand. But at that point, um, when she was surviving, she decided to make a move. She went up to Mendocino to make ceramic pots for a living. She stood, uh, she stayed there for a while and sold them at a, a, a local store. Um, and then um, because of her, her gift in, in illustration, she uh, started illustrating the incredible Victorian houses that are in the town of Mendocino. And that led to her producing a coloring book of, Victorian houses, which led to producing coloring books for five Victorian houses in five different cities, uh, Seattle and San Francisco, and I can't remember the rest of them. But um, so the coloring books became something that came out of her um, her gift with um, with her sculpt with her uh, drawing. Um, so then she went back to draw, to uh, sewing and made huge quilts um, that took a lot of work and a lot of time. And she did it until she couldn't stand doing, putting that much work in it um, and began making stuff sculptures. The stuff sculptures were something that were popular at the time she was doing it. She ended up in Rome and uh, had a show there and then went in Malta too. Then she came back to Berkeley again and in the eighties, um, she had a house in Berkeley and a family, and she used the house, the house as her palette and um, made murals on the walls and the ceilings and had um, time there to, to, to use their creative energy and her painting. Uh, from there, she moved to Point Reyes Station, again with another house again, involved in design and drawing and uh, helping to create the house. Um, the next project that she remembered was one of sacrilegious collages. And um, this was a political statement for her. It was something that was picked up by someone who became a close friend, Jennifer Thompson, uh, who at the time had uh, Thompson design and for about 10 years there, um, sacrilegious collages were uh, there at, at uh, Jennifer's shop and, and sold there. Um, following that sacrilegious collage, she did a show at Toby's, which is another one of 
kind of our community hangouts here that has a great gallery. And in that one, it was entitled Deities That Were Switched at Birth. And I think you get to see one or two of those uh, in the show today. Um, but basically, she just loved chopping up magazines and making collages of, of, uh, with political statements. In the 90s, she uh, followed a painting teacher that she really was fond of, uh, who was putting on a, a workshop down at Essel. And then that led to, uh, she said, about 20 years of following this, this painter until she passed. And, and also to the development and ongoing um, sangha of artists who meet annually for a week to get together and paint together, uh, critique together, and uh, value each other's creativity. One of the things that, that, that intrigued me was the picture that she painted uh, with words to me of crawling up on an eight foot ladder with a gloved hand and a bucket of paint and reaching into the bucket of paint and, and flicking paint on a canvas down below her on the ground. And she would do this and let it dry bring out a hose and um, as long as you have wash your this dirt, blast no, the paint in the off dock. of the, oh, okay. bla uh, blast this paint off of the uh, off of the canvas and it would leave a ghost image and then depending upon her muse of the day the um, process might get repeated a number of times so that there'd be layers of of different colors and different shapes and forms, she'd finally um, take the product that was the last layer and clean that off with the hose, let it dry, and then begin to fill those negative and positive uh, spaces with uh, acrylics. And you're gonna see some of those and, and the texture behind them, and she'll point it out to you, uh, below where she actually applies the, uh, the acrylics. It's just really wonderful to, to, to know the history of and to see. Um, two other things that she's done that, that intrigued me. She spent a whole year painting kelp. Um, kelp is a, um, uh, an annual seaweed that shows up on our shore out here in Point Reyes all along the California coast. And these bull kelp um, were the, the subject matter of the paintings that she did for that year. And in another year, she spent making houses out of children's blocks um, and they're whimsical and colorful. And you'll get to see one shot of those too. And uh, they turn out to be of great interest. Um, she had so many of them. She gave me a couple boxes and, and my my four-year-old granddaughter totally endorses the quality and imagination that's in those blocks. So uh, without any further descriptions, I'd like to have you meet Shirley. You probably, most of you already know her, but I'd like Shirley to, to have the, the, uh, the spotlight. It was a pleasure, uh, just a joyful, humorous, fun pleasure to get to be in her presence and learn of her art trip. Oh, thanks, Rich. That's, I sound pretty interesting. I, I hope uh, you find these pictures as interesting. We should, uh, I should tell you that that's a capsule summary of my life. And if you're ever interested, I'll tell you the other nine tenths of it. Uh, <laughs> but that was very, that pretty much uh, got some of the good highlights. And I'm not going to tell you uh, all the details, though. So um, the first picture I have to show you is, da da. there's me with some of those paintings he was describing where I get up on the ladder. These are all on paper, but I do it also in canvas. Um, you get up pretty high and drop the paint. It's got to be done outside, by the way, and it's got to be a sunny day. And then you uh, let that layer dry, hose it. I call it hosing. And then you let that layer dry, drop some paints. And so you just repeat until you've got something really uh, that you like. And all of these paintings that you see there 
were painted over with other paintings and sometimes to their detriment. But, you know, I, the teacher that he discussed was named Lee Hyams. Uh, just, I just loved her work and she was just very skillful, but very daring. And um, she gave me the essentially the permission because everybody has an art teacher that says, you can't make horses. And so that cuts them cuts them to shreds, but I never got that. So Lee further sent me on a journey of just experiments and make something that you like. And one out of 30, you're really like, and you should keep that one. So um, these are some of the bottom layers. You see, actually, you see one of those sacrilegious collages. That one is, you can't see it very well. It's in the corner. It's called White Tara babysits for the West. She's holding baby Jesus until the West catches up with the East. Uh, and the other one is, I think that is, uh, well, it's an Indian goddess riding a rooster and I made it for a friend's store just as a gift to his store. So in the next picture, you see the very beginning of my career that Rich described so nicely. Uh, there I am uh, saluting the flag, mind you, it's 1952. And uh, the principal of the school asked me to do this, do a drawing for the Shore Views, which was the Shore View School uh, newsletter, which was a half sheet of mimeograph typing paper. You can even see the color for your oldsters in the uh, audience. Uh, that was the height of printing in public schools in 1952. And uh, I knew I was going to be an artist from early on, and I stuck with it, even though, you know, I, my mother wanted me to be a scientist. I told her she was wrong. Next slide. You see, I'm calling them slides, which, uh, which all you people over 50 will know what a slide is. This is from one of the coloring books I did of San Francisco. Um, the first coloring book I did was of Mendocino, and it was not... Here I show every shingle, but in the one I did of Mendocino was, was much simpler and it was, I thought I was, you know, making fine art at the time, but now I see it and it was early, my early phase of Victorian house drawings. Anyway, um, in Mendocino, I sold cards and these Victorian house books. And then I got on to, um, my sister was a printer in Berkeley, had a big printing outfit and she did all these books for me on spec. I took them around, sold a lot of them. And then I got a distributor and they commissioned me to do them in other cities, as Rich was saying. And I was able to uh, make some sort of a living, which was, as, as he told you, the, the woman at the employment agency told me that I was unemployable. And I thought, well, but I'm still pretty, you know, I've got these skills, so why not um, work for myself? So. Um, I did. So this is one of hundreds of Victorian houses I drew. Uh, lately, someone asked me to draw a Victorian house as a, for their charitable organization. And I did of their headquarters or something. And they said, but you didn't sign it. And I said, for good reason. <laughs> I didn't want anybody else asking me to draw one. Okay, next picture. Oh, this is Mendocino. You see the house theme there. Um, but I learned to do, well, these are tiles. I learned to do tiles and I did some small pots, mostly just little pinch pots. I didn't become like a great potter or anything, but I had a very good time learning how to do this. And a friend and I were commissioned to do this fountain, which uh, when water comes out the top, it spills down the side and looks like it's raining. And a lot of the things are from broken pottery, but also from Glass Beach in, in Fort Bragg. So uh, it's still in front of the art center in Mendocino if you ever go there. Um, but I, I really enjoyed doing it. And in fact, years later, 20 years later, because this is from 1968, I, I went and took a mosaic class in another town and I thought, gee, I'll learn mosaic. And then they had this very photo up on their bulletin board as inspiration. And I thought, wait, I already know how to do mosaics. So I, it's, that's the randomness of the universe. 
All right, uh, the next photo. This is a, a slide from 1974. You see it's a little blurry because we reproduced it. And um, these two folks commissioned me to do this on their quite gigantic bed. And I had done many quilts before, but never one quite this big. And they wanted it to be of an oak tree in their um, backyard. They lived down the peninsula. And so I made it in the simplest forms. And the quilts I made, I made dozens, if not a hundred. And also smaller things that were called wall hangings at the time um, out of really yummy fabric. I, I picked it mainly for colors. I didn't, I wasn't a stickler for having it all cotton or something. I just like to choose colors that were really uh, pleasing. So I did stuff sculpture too. There's none of it shown here, but they were all fanciful, you know, two giant, giant pieces of toast popping out of a real toaster, but the toast was all, you know, made of stuffed fabric or stuffed, stuffed with styrofoam or something. Um, and then since I saw this in my collection of old slides, um, I decided to make a painting recently. So if you see the next picture, this is the very slide of the very quilt reproduced as a painting, it's 22 by 30 or so. And since I really like the effect of the quilting idea, I made these gold outlines. And I don't know if you can really tell, but there, this is on a, one of them, painting over painting, 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 there was a black ground. I primed it black. And you can, I, if you're, if you have an artist's eye, you can actually see that it has a slightly different quality in a lot of areas where it has a black ground. So I just take my inspiration where I get it. And that old photo inspired me. I, I really like to work from photographs of landscapes. I used to be outside and do it, but I didn't really like people coming along and asking me, quote, how long did it take you to do that? So I decided that photographs were great and I like to work on the table rather than on the wall. So it's convenient to put these things on the table. Okay, the next picture. This is a painting that was inspired by um, Hot Springs Creek at Esalen. And I think you can see really what Rich was describing, the underlayments or the previous paintings or the previous splotchings. And the rocks are just the old painting with colored glazes on each one. And the water, the blue parts of the water are blue glaze, which is just, a diluted acrylic paint. And then the white is opaque to represent the water. So this, I've done several of this creek just because it's so inspirational. All those years I spent maybe 20 years going to Esalen at Thanksgiving for a week with the same group of friends, which has been an inspiration. The place is an inspiration. The friends who have all different styles of paintings, but we all have, a, you know, it's an adventuresome group, adventurous group, and we're all still really good friends. Okay, the next one. This is also Esalen. This is the a beach that is so steep that it's now closed to the public. And this rock, which I actually climbed uh, 20 years ago, it's quite a fabulous landmark on the beach there. And this one also has a black ground. You can see where um, the texture of the old painting behind it, it's a certain technique of letting the texture of the painting, of the underpainting guide you. And then where you want it to be flat, like the blue of the ocean, uh, just paint it thicker and paint it thinner over the textures that you wanna keep. It's a patented secret. By the way, I want to, as Rich mentioned, tell you that if I'm, if people want to copy me or get an idea from me, I'm delighted. I don't have any special um, 
desire to uh, be famous or have this to be only my work. Um, I just like doing it. So go ahead, take some ideas away. Start painting, do something, make something. Okay, the next one. This is a recent uh, collage I made. In the last couple of years, I've decided that I would copy some great works of art just for fun, mostly delightful ones rather than real serious ones. I did Gauguin's puppies. This is um, Bonnard's still life. And each of these pieces is from several different paintings represented here that I cut up and repositioned to, if you, if you compare this to Brack's still life, it has some of the same qualities and it's bright and it's, the colors are more or less his colors and the shapes are more or less his shapes. And I really enjoyed doing this one. Use a lot of glue, it's very thick. You can see actually some shadows. Some of the paper I use is very heavy paper because I'm so heavy handed. So you'll see I like under the red bowl with the oranges in it, you'll see the shadows that the paper, even though it's glued down, sticks out a little. I recommend doing this. If you paint a lot of paintings and you think they're awful, don't throw them away. Use them in a collage and um, this, I do have one, one friend and I that get together in each other's studio and chop up each other's paintings and recombine them. I, I highly recommend it as entertainment, if not art. Okay, the next one. This is another painting from Esalen. This is when I discovered the method of paint. You can paint over your old paintings. This one's, I don't know, pretty big, two and a half by three and a half, something like that on and you see there's islands in the background. This is a view out to sea and it's getting dark and the tree is on the edge of the cliff and it's lit up. But you can see that there's a lot of, oh, you might call them missteps, but I like the serendipity of it all. And uh, I'm not cutting this one up, I like it. So the next one. This is one of the collages that Rich spoke of. This one's called The Lamentation. It's from when I was in Assisi, I bought a poster of The Lamentation by Giotto and they're putting Christ in the grave and they're lamenting. And I thought I would do an update on it. Um, it's a fresco. So when I cut out the world to glue it on there, I had to rough it up a little so that it would look more or less like a fresco. And they're the lamenting the planet. I mean, hopefully we can do something about it, but they're having the lamenting before uh, the person rises. I forget if it's Lazarus or Jesus, but it's somebody important and, but not as important as the world. Okay, for the next one. Ah, this is the Baldacchino in the Vatican in Rome. And this one is titled an unnecessary miracle. And you, I mean, why? You didn't need to do that miracle. It was unnecessary. Um, and this is a photo, I believe, from National Geographic. And the plate of eggs was some from some school demonstrations of things in your home that was from the 50s, from some school room that I was helping clean out at my child's public school. There were pictures of just, you know, cans of spinach, fried eggs, a pineapple, and they were all in the style of the 50s. Okay, the next one. Oh, and this is the description that Rich was saying um, about the houses. Um, I don't know what inspired me to do this, but I, I love houses. I mean, I've built houses and I've fixed up houses and I've um, participated in the real estate wars, uh, but I really like to make houses. So these are all children's block sets that I, I guess blocks are over, 
and kids are doing some plastic these days. So these are all wooden blocks and or things I found on the beach. And behind the, where they're all posed here on a couple of my paintings, which I just use using here as backgrounds. And the paintings are also uh, towns as seen from above. I don't know whether that's obvious or not, but the yellow house in the center is on an island in a town and they're all painted with metallic paint. And the little spots on them are um, prints that I've made of other paintings of mine and glued them on. And then some of them you can't really tell in here, but I put glitter and on later ones I was using pipe cleaners and marbles and chessmen and little railroad people just because why not? And uh, I did make several hundred of them and I gave them a bunch of them to, for, to be for sale through the local um, housing, um, affordable housing coalitions called CLAM and they put stickers on the bottom. Um, everyone needs a house and then the website to donate. So they came to some good use and my relatives all have them. And now Rich has a few boxes for his granddaughter, but I made hundreds. And then one day I couldn't do it anymore. And actually Rich said also that one day I painted, one year I painted kelp, it's true. I now um, don't paint kelp. I just, once I've sort of run something into the ground, uh, I get tired of it. So, and if I try to go back and do it again, it seems like it's a pot boiler or something. So I'm moving on. I'm but I've always loved landscapes. So that one's never gone away. So the next slide. This is another town from above. This is a big painting on canvas. And um, you see underneath all those little dots in the background. That's what Rich was describing, getting up on a ladder and dropping paint and hosing off between the layers. That was really fun. And then I drew this town over the top and there's a, a sea anemone in the middle kind of directing traffic. I love sea anemones. And there's a zoo at the bottom. There's always gotta be zoo in every town. And uh, I, I did a lot of these and I'm sort of over that now too. So I'm back at landscapes. Alrighty, for the next one. Oh, okay, this is what I do of an evening, especially if I'm pissed off. I get some fashion magazines, chop them up. I got a glue stick and a pair of nice scissors and I make fun of high fashion. And I've done hundreds and hundreds of these. They've never stopped fascinating me. I wanna recommend once COVID is over, go back to the magazine recycling bins, get yourself a stack, glue stick, scissors and paste them up, paste them up. This one, as you can see, is just for my own entertainment. So this, there's writing in the corner about somebody's outfit. Um, and some of them are funnier than others. This one is just like, this outfit just didn't seem like a fashion statement for some reason. It was a dog. Okay, next one. This is back to the landscape. This one is this slide, this painting, the slide of the painting is a little blurry, but you get the idea. This is north of where I live and it, the sky is really that blue and the water is reflecting that blue. It's, um, if you drive up Highway 1 past Point Ray Station, you see this is the landscape. It's a little, I live right on the edge of, I'm the last subdivision in town. So if you just drive north like 50 feet, you're into the quote countryside. A lot of people get lost trying to find my house. So um, this one's acrylic on paper and I painted a uh, border on this one for some reason. Um, and also I use a lot of Sharpie markers. So I recommend that, don't be shy. Just don't give them to your kids, they smell funny. They're probably poisonous or something, but I, I like outlines. And I, I started seriously painting landscapes when I was in high school and 
they told me that I shouldn't outline things. And I told them, I'm going to outline them whether you like it or not. So there you go. Okay, the next one. And this is also um, a landscape um, that I, it's on canvas and I painted two frames around this one. Um, it was inspired by some Aboriginal art that had generally this composition, but you can see in the background, uh, there are ghosts of several layers of mainly white drips that I had a lot of fun making this one. And then I did a drawing with a Sharpie marker and painted in just glazed over each section. So it's kind of a fantasy landscape it was just inspired by this woman in Australia, an Aboriginal woman who paints landscapes. So that's what I'm doing these days. I'm just painting more and more landscapes. Oh, I, this is not illustrated, but um, I did a series, I think I'm on my fifth one now, of tablecloths. You measure some canvas. This is an advanced technique. You measure the canvas exactly the size of your table and buy primed canvas for sure, because it's easier. And then paint on six placemats on, on a dark ground. Place six paint. I do landscapes, so I have a landscape tablecloths. And uh, don't ask for one, because I think this will be my last one. Okay, next slide. Oh, and there I am. Uh, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago. And um, this is an example of how I feel about religion. Everyone can be a, a goddess or a god, depending on your proclivities. And there I am, rising full grown out of a baked apple. So actually, I did use this one as an ID once I, I couldn't get into a gym in New York because I didn't have my ID on me. And I said, go to my website and you see if that's me. And I told them my name and I said, now Google up that and you'll see if it's really me. And I don't have that website anymore. Um, but it was the woman let me in the gym. So, so there. Anyway, uh, does anyone have any interesting questions? You walk on water, Cheryl. These are fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just give me some water. <laughs> Thank you. I have well, many of them hanging on my wall, and I, and I love every one of them. Thank you. Um, I have to say one other thing. Uh, when they asked me to put up this, do this for the uh, dance palace, I said, sure, and I spent an entire day looking at my computer and I've only had an iPhone for 10 years or so. And there were you know, a few from before that, 13,000 pictures and maybe 5,000 were the beach and a thousand were various grandchildren, but there were hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And I, before um, LA, who's the organizer said, you know, I think 20 is enough. Um, and, but I had to like, I had a life review. And like when you die, supposedly you have a life review. And uh, my life flashed before me in these hundreds and hundreds of paintings. In fact, you see the one behind me? Uh huh. Okay, that's called Three Parking Meters, Berkeley, 1967. One of my favorites. I gave it away to a girlfriend of mine who moved to Mexico and it's a safekeeping here in my room until she returns. So um, there were hundreds though and I had to really concentrate like, what is the meaning of this? And um, actually there, there wasn't any, it was just a bunch of pictures and um, I really enjoyed doing it. So thanks for asking me guys. I was a little, I had a little trepidation think, do I want to do this? But I really enjoyed it. So thanks, Dance Palace. Oh, and if I make any money, I'm giving a big percentage to the Dance Palace because they need it. Yes, thank you. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm actually going to post the 
information about how to contact Shirley um, about purchasing original art or also she has some amazing prints available online too. So I'm posting that now. And we have a question here in the chat uh, from Melissa wondering how you decide to keep working on a painting or stop. Uh, I had a high school teacher who told me when how that worked. He said, a painting needs two people, one to paint the painting and the other one to shoot him before he thinks he's finished. <laughs> <laughs> You can muck it up pretty bad. Luckily, since I'm so prolific, I have no um, qualms about painting over stuff. So if something, I think, gee, why did I ever paint that? Even if I liked it before, I'm just like, okay, I need the canvas, I'll just paint over it. I don't, you know, storage becomes a problem. And my partner's also an artist. And, uh, you know, it's only, uh, we have a house and it's full of stuff. So, um, I just paint until I feel like I, I've had enough. And then sometimes if you go away, you have a painting, you put it up and you come back in the morning, do you still respect it? Like sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just wanna put it in the filing. I have a filing, uh, flat files and most of them fit in the flat files. So, and I have a little storage unit in the backyard for canvas stuff that I, don't want to paint over already. So that's the answer. Just keep painting until somebody shoots you. <laughs> Shirley? Yeah? Did you have one happier period than the other or sad periods when you look at your, when you take everything and make it a decade long? Is there a special period? Hmm. I'm a pretty optimistic person and uh, I'm a lucky duck. So um, due to circumstances of my life, I don't have to make a living any longer, which is pretty thrilling, guys. For those of you who have to make a living, it's pretty thrilling. So um, I'd say that the, the part that I'm in is usually the happiest part uh, because, as I was talking with Rich earlier, it's like when you review the past, uh, you can't do anything about it. But if you're in the present, you actually can do something about it. So, uh, you know, you could get happier. Um, but if you had a sad period in the past, you don't want to stay there too long. You don't want to review it too often is what I'm saying. So I did review uh, a lot of stuff. And even, you know, that little picture of me saluting the flag when I was six years old, um, you know, I, I, I reviewed my life. And I think this is the best section. And I've had some pretty good sections, Laura. Good. <laughs> I've known with Laura for years, and she knows me through some some thick and thins. Yeah. So we've got we've got some other questions here in the chat that kind of weave into what you're just talking about. Um, there's a couple. I'm going to read them together and kind of see if you want to respond. Um, so Emily's asking, where do your ideas come from? And then there's a question from Marsha and Lily. Um, question, what is your secret to being so prolific? I'll ask those two together. Keep at it. Just keep at it. Also, it really helps to live in a paid for house. And just another tip, another life tip, um, because then it, your worries are reduced reduced. And so if you get up in the morning and you're pretty happy and you are free, uh, that's a good, good enough impetus for me. Um, some days I don't feel like it. And, but luckily I live in a place where I go, I go hiking every day, go hiking. Uh, a lot of the hiking trails are closed around here now. So I've been going to the beach every day, um, except on weekends. It's a little crowded here on weekends. So I leave the parking places for the people who are don't have this during the week. So um, I love that. I went this morning and that usually that's inspiration enough. So I come home and I want to paint something, but I don't know, there's the off days when you don't feel like doing anything. And then there's, you know, that 700 page book you're trying to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep at it, just keep at it, you know. That one you asked me not too long ago for a picture of my junk drawer for yes. inspiration. I was wondering what was that about? That's my brother Steve who has a very fascinating junk drawer. 
when he moved to a new house and his new gym drawer was not as fascinating because it didn't have that collection. So that was, I thought, gee, you know, what, what's abstract art? Junk. So Steve, uh, wait till your junk drawer uh, matures and then send me another photo. I'm saving, I'm saving a, a couple of mine, Cheryl. I have great <laughs> junk drawers. I love junk drawers. Uh, yeah, send, email me, email your, me your um, junk drawers. Maybe that's my next thing, you know? Junk drawer paintings, abstract <laughs> junk. Maybe you'll you just didn't find talk at all about the. Uh, you didn't talk at all about the smalls search for housing. Oh yeah, that was one of my other years. Uh, I got this idea that um, California is so difficult to find real estate in California that you know regular people can afford. So luckily, I bought my house forty years ago or something. So. Um, I set out to find housing for people about this tall HO gauge railroad people. And I got a bunch of railroad people and I set them up looking for housing. Uh, they tried a beer can on the beach. It was a family, Mr. and Mrs. Small and their boy, whose name was uh, Tiny, I think. And they uh, also uh, tried to camp in the woods. They had a little teeny tiny station wagon. They tried to camp in the woods, but there was a banana slug at the campground, which was about three times as big as their station wagon. <laughs> and uh, then they, I took a photo of them standing in front of a collection of salt yeah. shakers for their shaker community. No, that was too uptight for them. And then they tried to move into one of those pill boxes that has Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. She thought that was too small e even for them. Um, they never did really find a house until they got a, um, a van and moved into the Walmart parking lot. And she got a job as a greeter at the Walmart and uh, she was saving up to send him to, to nursery school in Palo Alto, which was only $50,000 a year. And uh, he got a job at the Irrational Technology Foundation in Menlo Park and uh, working for Dr. Zarkoff. And the wall box, the wall box was a plastic box that was full of trinkets, junky trinkets. And that was the wall box. And the foundation for irrational technology was, uh, I think it was a fish tank that was turned upside down on all this like electronic detritus that was filling it. So that's where he was working. I had a great time doing that. Uh, but then one day I lost interest. So I, um, all I have to say is uh, just keep doing whatever you're doing. And when you lose interest, do something else. That's the answer to that. <laughs> Thank you for that. That <laughs> was some great words. Um, and with that, I, I, like, I want to ask a question that is really related um, from Sean here in the chat asking, how has art changed over the years and what changes do you like and not like so much? Oh, I just finished a 700 page book called um, Ninth Street Women. It's about Lee Krasner and uh, Jackson Pollock's um, wife and then Elaine de Kooning. And they sort of invented, invented modern art or like expressive art, um, expressionism, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they liked, most of them liked being starving artists. And once it all became about money, it wasn't as much fun. It wasn't, you know, some of the people got too interested in the money. So, um, and I've done art, art for money before, you know, because it was more fun than being a secretary. Um, but I think that art has changed over the last, the last hundred years. I just joined a site called Fine Art America. There are half a million artists on this site and they're all trying to sell something. They sell prints and teacups and everything. So there's a lot of artists out there. And I think that's what changed. People are no longer thinking that Picasso is the only person in the world who can paint and just go to an art supply store and get yourself something and you're a painter. So. And then the, more, the longer you do it, 
the more um, the easier and more fun it is actually. And that's all I have to say. I think art has really changed over the last hundred years and more people can be an artist. So go for it. That's my advice. So I think there's time for about one more question um, so that we can wrap it up on time. Um, and I'm seeing kind of a repeated question here from a couple folks asking, have you ever painted people portraits and why don't you paint people? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm just kind of looping them both. Well, in, in a word, it's too hard. Uh, but there are other reasons. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, if you, you're painting a landscape uh, and the tree is crooked, people, nobody knows. If you get the nose pointed in the wrong direction, it's going to be ruinous. And I do have a friend who's a portrait painter, and he paints the same pose for three weeks for several hours a day. And they're beautiful. Now, I don't have that sort of uh, patience, frankly. Um, I recently did a portrait of my uh, partner and uh, uh, he was uh, sort of thrilled, but his mouth was to so wrong that it looked like, you know, it looked wrong. So that's why I probably don't paint portraits, guys. Just, just, uh, just an art secret, it's hard. I do have another friend, Jennifer, who's smiling at me now, paints wonderful portraits. And I went to visit her in the studio the other day. Her studio is clean. <laughs> so it's tidy, it's clean. And if you come and see my studio, you would see a different story. It's a mess. There's paint on the floor, there's paint on the walls, there's paint on the furniture, and um, there's paint on my jeans. Uh, you, the photo at the beginning of this lecture shows me in my dress outfit. Normally, I wipe, my hands, I wipe my hands on my legs rather than, you know, using towels or something. So uh, it's a mess. So I want to commend people who have the courage and the patience to do portraits, but uh, it's hard. Yeah, I have another question. Hey, Shirley, if your house caught on fire and you had to grab one painting, which one would it be? Shoot, that's a good question. It'd be Carlos Parada's uh, picture of the bear with the clover in his mouth. <laughs> 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 Thanks for asking. <laughs> Uh, All right. Don't well, worry, Shirley. The whole don't worry, Shirley. The whole neighborhood would come running to the house to grab whatever <laughs> you had to save it. Okay, you're welcome, guys. Welcome. <laughs> come on around. Well, to my neighbors, uh, to everybody. Thanks for watching. I I actually enjoyed doing this. I I thought I wouldn't, but I did. So it wasn't that hard. And LA and Rich kind of coached me through the technical part of it. And so thanks guys and good luck to the dance palace. They deserve your support. So adios everybody. Thank you. Thanks. We're gonna pass thanks, Shirley. <laughs> thanks Shirley. You're welcome. Thanks Shirley. I'm sure. gonna pass the word over to Richard, uh, Richard Clark uh, to close us out. If everyone wants to stay around. Well, I do. There we go. Let's see, am I muted? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and being a part of this. You can see why I was, um, I was really <laughs> uplifted and during this time of COVID. Each time I went over to Shirley's and laughed and giggled and, and had her tell stories. And she's really got a lot of stories to tell beyond what she told us today. So. You know, if you ever have the chance, um, there's something to mind there that'll keep you going. Um, it's important to us to hear from you. Uh, we will be sending out, I guess, LA, you're going to talk about that, right? You okay, can so talk about whatever you want, and then I can cover whatever didn't get. Done. Okay. <laughs> so, LA is going to send out some information to everybody who signed on today <clears throat> and was here and participated. Uh, what do we get? 60 people? Roughly, it looked like about 60. Um, it's a great showing, um, and it's uh, an honor for uh, me to know that uh, Shirley had such a following. Um, thank you for being here.
It's yours, LA. All right. Let's see if I can um, spotlight myself here. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thanks for folks who stuck, stuck around um, till the end. Thank you for all your comments also. Um, I will be sharing all of these comments with Shirley because it's so much to say right now. If you have questions that you didn't get time to ask, you can contact Shirley. Um, you can contact Shirley in the, with the information that I shared here in the chat. And if, you're, if it's all moving too fast and you don't have time to copy the links, we will be sending out an email tomorrow. So all this information will be in the email tomorrow. Um, Lastly, this show was recorded. So um, if you want to go back and look at it or if you want to share with friends, it will be going up um, tomorrow. So I shared here in the chat um, basically a playlist of all of our past artist receptions. So you can, you know, make a bowl of popcorn and uh, do a artist reception marathon if you want, you know. Um, so with that, I think that's all I've got. What? Yes. I, for, I forgot to mention that next next month, we've got Sue Gonzalez, another artist in the community who happens to be in the neighborhood. And over the um, and we don't have the date yet, but we will have her next month. Um, and we've got a handful of artists that have committed uh, for the rest of the year. Nancy Stein and, uh, oh yeah, uh, I can't I open my mouth. Um, Bruce Mitchell's gonna do wood. Um, we really got some, it's going to be a lot of fun. So stay tuned. We've got good things going for the community and for you all out there. Yes, absolutely. It's going to be a good, it's going to be a full year of exciting receptions, all sorts of mediums. So anyway, um, we'll let you go and have dinner. I just wanted to say one more time, Shirley, thank you so much. Um, such an inspiration to hear you talk and just Thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to work with you too. So um, thank you everyone who came out from all over the world. Um, have a great night, have a great dinner um, or whatever time it is there. And yeah, we'll see you next month. Bye. <laughs>